As far as announcements go, I don't have any really. I do have some concerns. Uh, Norm Willoughby, the uh, man that comes and tunes the organ and stuff, is uh, what in his 80s? Maybe late 70s. Late, late, well, it's about our age anyhow. And uh, he has quite a few health issues and keep him in our prayers. Sharon is going to have her uh, other eye done this week. That'll be on Wednesday. Uh, this girl graduated in uh, 1963 in my brother's class, Connie Hopkins, and I saw in the uh, paper today her obituary, and uh, she's sort of a cousin, I guess. Any other announcements? Yes, Al? I prayer for George Walter. Oh, I haven't heard it from George for a while. Prayers for George Walter? Walker. Walker. What? Birthdays. 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 Anybody had a birthday in November? One, two, three. Stand up. We're going to sing happy birthday. <laughs> I'm sorry. She is standing up. <laughs> saying you're about three. Is that right? What? Three? Four. Four. Ooh. That was last year, I remember. Yeah. Okay, any others? Okay. I am going to do the uh, minute for mission. Some of you may have wondered why the burial names are on the uh, windows. I'll give you a little bit of uh, history about why. Uh, Matthew and Angelina were uh, 
residents of Bellbrook. They lived about, uh, well, they actually lived right out at uh, Spring Valley, Centerville Road, and Waynesville Road. Uh, Matthew was the son of Alex Berryhill, and Alex was a uh, Revolutionary War soldier. He was injured in the Revolutionary War. He got hit by a uh, sword, and it cut his, uh, put a big scar on his uh, forehead. Alex was from Lexington, Virginia, and he had seven sons and four daughters, and all the kids were born down there. And uh, when you have 11 kids, there's pretty good disparity in age. So the uh, two oldest sons come up and settled over around uh, Spring Valley, what's now Spring Valley Township, but it was Sugar Creek Township in 1809, and one of them actually got married here in 1809. They talked to their dad to come up to uh, this area. He bought 640 acres at the uh, intersection of uh, uh, Spring Valley Centerville Road and Waynesville Road. They, uh, people back then would travel in groups, so I think a whole number of uh, churches uh, got together and there were other Presbyterians that come up from that same area. And for a while, they washed the, in uh, Alex's house. He had a big two-story log cabin, and they washed it there. Then they come into Bellbrook, and right out where Rogers live, which is uh, at the 720, or Franklin Street and uh, Little Sugar Creek up on the hill, they built a, a wood church. And they used it, and it got too small. And there was a Universalist church on this site. And the Universalist Church had a bell. So that was in 1857. Uh, Matthew did not have children. First of all, Alex had about 80 grandchildren. Out of the 11 kids, there were about 80 grandchildren. And, uh, Matt, but Matthew and Angelina did not have children. But they would take nieces and nephews and other people and help raise them. But when uh, Matthew died in 1890, he left tons of money for the church, and a lot of people in the town got like $1,000 grants, which in 1890 was a huge sum of money. So the church was built in 1891, and they put the, the names on the windows. Uh, some of his brothers, his brother was my uh, great-great-grandfather, there's still quite a few of the Berry Hill houses in the community. How come there are not more Berry Hills around here now? Well, they were all farmers, and if you divide them up with 80 grandchildren, you know, you get a farm about a half an acre. So uh, they moved on. They went north and uh, mostly out in Iowa, which was the new frontier. Seventy years ago, I was sitting up here listening to the children's sermons. And since then, our uh, kids, grandkids and stuff have been up here. And we had a children's choir. I was in it, but they told me just to mouth and not actually <laughs> sing. <laughs> and there were two or three others who got the same uh, thing. And, uh, but the church has always been a big part of our lives. And, Right now, I'm glad to see that uh, a lot of the uh, new people and uh, younger people are taking over leadership roles. I think that's in part a lot to uh, Diane's effort to uh, make this a very successful church. And I'd also like to welcome Diane back. She needs a rest. Thank you.
morning, everyone. Beautiful out. Please join me in our call to worship. Whether we embrace God's call in our lives or try to avoid it, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Whether we are long timers or late comers in the life of faith, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Whether our lives in Christ are comfortable or bring hardship, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We praise God's name forever and ever. Please stand for Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Because we do not always live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, we confess before God and one another our sins and shortcomings. In repentance, let us turn towards God's grace and mercy. God of abundant goodness, we confess that we want your grace for ourselves, but often wish punishment or exclusion on others. We judge the efforts and motives of others while ignoring the faults of our own. Forgive us, we pray, when we let jealousy overtake us. Forgive us, we pray, when we are petty, even in the presence of your generosity. Forgive us, we pray, when we feel slighted by you. May we ask once again for your mercy Will you help us to be more merciful toward one another? We pray in the name of Christ Jesus, by whose grace we are saved. Amen. God extends to us mercy beyond our deserving, grace beyond our ability to earn it. God has granted us the privilege of believing in Christ. Therefore, we will live as grateful and forgiven people. Thanks be to God. of Jesus Christ, in whom are you trusting? Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and also with you. Please verbally share the greeting of peace with those around you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. 
I brought up today a piece of the awesome boxes that you all miss out on that are so much fun. In every box, there is an interactive piece that the kids can learn what the main point of the story is. Today is lesson nine out of 11 in our awesome box, and the story is Jonah. And I'm showing you this one because I think it's my favorite out of all of them. So when the kids get their box, it says the point, which means the main idea of this lesson. And if you pull Jonah out of the whale, the main idea for today is no matter what we do, God's love for us never changes. So I think the kids are enjoying their boxes and I know that we've enjoyed putting things together for them. Please join with me in our prayer of illumination. Gracious God, your word surprises, challenges, upsets, and overturns our way of seeing and thinking. Come and find us today wherever we are, however we are. By the power of the Holy Spirit, cause that which is withering in us to blossom and that which is exacting in us to broaden until we see as you see and thereby glimpse the kingdom you are bringing. In Christ's name we pray. The New Testament reading, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> sinus drainage again, uh, is from Luke 18, verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Old Testament reading today is from uh, Jonah. And I have to tell you something. I asked Diane if I could tell you before I started because I thought this was so appropriate. I don't know if you saw it on TV or not, but this week they showed two women out in a bright yellow co uh, kayak, and uh, they were off the coast of California, and all of a sudden a whale came up, seriously, and the women and their kayak went in its mouth. So, see, Jonah, <laughs> except they got out right away. <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay, uh, this is, uh, Jonah tries to run away from God. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them both. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what do people say you are? You are? I'm a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the God 
the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is this you have done? For the men knew that the, he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you the sea, that the sea might quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more temptuous. I just lost my place. <laughs> he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now these women were only in there for like three minutes. <laughs> then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up out of my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I with a voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim it to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to the Lord. All who turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands, who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them and did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. 
And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you're concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If we accomplish nothing else today, we have read an entire book of the Bible. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day and for your people, for this church, and for Jesus Christ. Grant us your presence and your peace, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Well, Jonah, as you may have gathered, is designed to be a story that has some humor to it. The bush that appears and disappears and ticks Jonah off, for example. And in the spirit of humor, I came across a Get Fuzzy cartoon this week that seems appropriate for both Jonah and the day. I don't know how familiar you are with Get Fuzzy, but it's a um, strip about a cat and a dog. And I just want to share this uh, strip with you. So in the first frame, Satchel the dog enters and tells Bucky the cat, I finally beat Angry Birds. Satchel shows Bucky his cell phone with the progress, and Satchel says, did you hear me? I beat Angry Birds. Bucky the cat turns around and acknowledges Satchel without saying anything. Then Bucky moves towards Satchel with a box and says, Satchel, do you see this shoebox? And Satchel says, yeah. Bucky says, it holds my big whoop collection. Satchel says, big whoops? Massive whoops, Bucky says. But notice how I do not give you any. Satchel says, they look like treats. Bucky replies, as a sparrow may be mistaken for a finch, so may a whoop resemble a treat. Yes, I think those are treats, Satchel says. Yes, they are whoops. And you will have neither treat nor whoop from me. Bucky answers. Last frame, Satchel says, I think you are full of it. And Bucky says, once again, I refer you to my big whoops, of which I give you none. We've probably all had a time or two in the presence of someone who was making much out of a little, be it angry birds or something else, seeking affirmation, and yet we had no whoops for them. But even in its humor, this cartoon points to a legitimate hurt and need, a real lack of empathy between these two characters. Satchel is seeking acknowledgement for his 
success in finally beating Angry Bird, something he had been striving for, and Bucky the cat will give him nothing. No whoops for you, Satchel, no treats. His sense of accomplishment is snubbed completely. Once again, I refer you to my big whoops, of which I give you none. No empathy, no recognition. Who cares that you beat angry birds? Empathy is the ability to recognize, understand, and share the thoughts and feelings of another person or cat or dog. It's the ability to see that we need to give a whoop to and for someone else, maybe not because we want to, but because our brother or sister needs us to care for them. And sometimes, like for Jonah and Nineveh, it's very hard. Jonah's got absolutely no whoops, no treats for Nineveh at all. He doesn't even want to give them the time of day when the word of the Lord came to him and told him to go cry out in that great city. He didn't want to go at all. No whoops for Nineveh. Instead, he went straight the other way, fleeing for Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. No time, no words, no treats, no whoops. For the people of Nineveh, he ran the other way, away from the presence of the Lord. It's understandable, of course, Jonah would not want to go there, not to Nineveh. Many biblical prophets were sent into places and before faces that they would have preferred to avoid. Like Elisha, who we read about last week, Elisha, who had a bounty on his head and was sent into the middle of nowhere to hide, to be fed by the ravens and wait. Risky it was. But Jonah gets a real humdinger of a call. God calls him to go to Nineveh to preach to Nineveh how absurd It was the heart, the capital of Assyria, the nation that had felled the northern kingdom where Jonah was from, the nation that deported the citizens of that kingdom, those they didn't kill, that is, to other parts of the world. Assyria had unleashed tremendous violence and pain on Jonah's people, and Nineveh was at Assyria's core. It was known for its wickedness and evil and violence. It was a symbol that all opposed the Lord and the Lord's people. No wonder Jonah had no whoop for Nineveh. No wonder Jonah didn't want to go. And he went in the other direction, away from the presence of the Lord. No treat, no whoop for you, Nineveh. But God's assigned tasks aren't so easy to escape and God's steadfast love cannot be avoided or withheld even from Nineveh. Jonah could care less about that city and its people, about the possibility of the Ninevites being preached to, maybe even redeemed. He could care less about their salvation. After all, who needs them? But even in all of their wickedness and sin, God looks down on the people of that great city and longs for them to repent, to turn from evil, and to worship him. And it is Jonah, Jonah who has no interest in this task at all, who has chosen to go and proclaim the word of the Lord there in Nineveh. He's got nothing not even a whiff of a whoop to offer for these people, and yet he is the one God has chosen to call. After a terrifying ship ride being tossed into the sea, swallowed by a whale, carried in its belly for three days, spit out on a beach, and called a second time to go, Jonah finally does relent. And then according to the word of the Lord, he heads to Nineveh to speak. He will have to dig deep to drum up at least a fragment of a whoop to give to Nineveh, if even only so that his task is complete and he can leave and go home. Jonah's sermon to the Ninevites is five Hebrew words. 
Remarkably, those five words are enough to take people known for nothing good and bring them to full repentance. Every man, woman, and child, every animal in that city kneels in repentance before God. Where there was no hope, now there is some. Where there was no empathy or awareness, of wrong, there is now a complete change where there was no shred of a whoop with just five words. The lives of 120,000 people are turned around. It is impossible to escape God's task, Jonah finds, and it is impossible also to avoid God's love, even for those we'd rather not love. Well, rather than being pleased with his progress and the impact of his micro-sermon, Jonah is mad, hot mad. God looked down on the repentance of the Ninevites with compassion and changed his mind and decided not to destroy that city. Rather than being elated, Jonah is deflated. He's ticked off. He knew God was full of grace and mercy. He knew God abounded in steadfast love. He knew God was a God ready to relent from punishing. But the Ninevites? Really? He'd rather die than extend a whoop to them. Rather die than see God soft on such sin. Who would care about those people? Why would God even want to give them a chance to repent? But as he finds, it is impossible to escape God's tasks, and it is also impossible to avoid God's love. According to the word of the Lord, Jonah went and he preached. He played just a teeny tiny role, a five-word role, even in his unwilling self, in bringing the people of Nineveh to change and repentance. His disappointment is deep. He sits down outside the city walls in a little booth he built for himself and pouts while he waits to see what God does. He's burning in his disappointment and frustration and the Ninevites being given a chance to live. He sits there ready to die rather than give a whoop for this people that he thought God would destroy. This bush randomly grows and provides him some shade from the sun, and then the bush is gone, and he's even madder, even more willing and ready to die. But wait, God seems to say. That's exactly the point. Let's look at this more closely. If you, Jonah, are so bent out of shape about a bush that you didn't grow, about a bush for which you did not labor, then can't you understand how I, God, would be concerned about Nineveh, about a city of more than 120,000 people? As horrible as the Ninevites may have been, they are not outside the love of Almighty God. It's impossible to escape God's tasks, and it is impossible to avoid God's love, even for the Ninevites. I laughed at that Get Fuzzy cartoon, especially when I thought of the way that our cat looks with absolutely no love on our neighbor's dogs next door. But there's something bigger than cats and dogs in it, something that speaks to us of pain and need and how we choose to respond. Most of us need someone who will give a whoop to and for us in these days. And most of us will encounter someone who will need us to give a whoop to and for them in these days. In the fractures of opinions and election stuff and fatigue and fear over COVID and the stress and strain and grief of our own lives, it is a lot. One option is to be like Bucky, I suppose, and clamp the lid of our shoebox closed and say, no treats or whoops for you. Can't take it anymore. I don't care if you beat angry birds. The other, a lot harder, 
is to try to be like Christ, who always gave a whoop for others, even those with whom he struggled, even those who spat on him, even those who nailed him to the cross. There's a very obvious and yet simultaneously extremely difficult point to achieve in between those two responses, a point that Jonah struggles to find to give concern for a whoop for someone else, especially someone we'd rather not love, we have to remember what Jonah always knew, that God is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and ready to relent. And because of that, like the man who cried out in the Gospel of Luke, we have been forgiven and loved and redeemed. That's really good news. The hard thing is God wills that same thing for the entire world, even those Ninevites and everyone we meet. The ones even that we'd rather close ourselves to. God doesn't love us any less because he loves them, but he loves the entire world and he hopes that in Jesus' name we will too. Regardless of so many things, what we think or what will be or what is happening or what we face, there is good news. God's love never fades, it never goes away, and it is for the entire world. God gives the biggest of whoops for us. His grace and mercy is never ending. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And thanks be to God, he is always ready to relent from punishing. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die for us that we might live, all of us. Spit out from the belly of a whale onto a beach, we're called from our homes and these very pews here in Bellbrook, there is good news for us this day. A funny thing about the gospel is that just when we think we would feel better with holding our whoops, closing our shoebox, when we go ahead and tend to our neighbor and lend an ear, when we care for one another in the world, goodness beyond our imagination unfolds. For Jonah, 120,000 people repented, a ship's crew turned to God, and to top it off, he got a ride in the belly of a whale. Who would have imagined? Not Jonah. Not Jonah who went away from the presence of the Lord, only to turn around again according to the word of the Lord and serve. May you receive what you need from Almighty God this day, and may we seek to grant what we each need to each other. And then may we go according to the word of the Lord and give a whoop for the entire world in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you sing with me, please? Seek ye first.
let us boldly join our voices as we state what we believe. Join me in speaking the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. This week we'll take a little extra time to recognize and remember and say thank you to our veterans. I want to share a little story with you of one Presbyterian who served in the Army many years ago, and then um, I have a mission for us as a congregation, for those of us who are here and those of us who are at home. There was a, a man named Thomas McNeil Bulla, who was a Presbyterian minister. He um, was born in North Carolina in 1881 and was ordained in Virginia in 1913. He was serving four congregations simultaneously at the time that he entered into the Army in 1917, and in June of 1918, his regiment um, went to France. And um, on October 15th, that very unit of which he was a part became the lead in an attack uh, that occurred at a place called Moleville Farm. And during that uh, battle, Bulla was exposed to enemy fire, not because he had to be, but because he chose to be. There were some um, soldiers who were um, across a no man's land space, and he decided to try to go after them to bring them back. It was a duty not required of chaplains, but he went ahead and he was struck and mortally wounded and um, within two days died from those injuries. When he was ordained, um, he was asked to respond to a question, and that question is this. Do you engage to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties? as a Christian, and as a minister of the gospel, whether personal or relative, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your conversation and to walk with exemplary piety before the flock, which God shall make you an overseer. And in that commitment, he lived and died that someone else maybe might live. So we think of all of those who serve so selflessly, many of whom are among us today or worshiping with us from home. I'm hoping that together we can take some time to give these special people some acknowledgement this week. Each one has a story, just like Thomas Bulla did. Some of them are stories of places or other people or the reason why they chose to serve. But in these days when we particularly seek to remember them, I hope that we can work together to make sure that every one of our veterans gets a call or a postcard or a note or some time in which we share and hear from them their story and a little bit about their time of service. So if you would like to be part of that, I invite you to call me or text me or call the office tomorrow, and we will get this set up so that we can make sure each one of these special people gets a special recognition 
this week. With that, may we turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you are indeed a God of grace and steadfast love, and we thank you for all that you are and do this day. We thank you for calling us to live honorably with one another, to extend our care to each other, to pray for your grace and help as we try to do all that you call us to and require in us and of us. And in these days, we ask, we pray that you would increase in us love for you and our neighbor without reserve, even love for those who are difficult for us to love, not half-heartedly, but with our whole hearts. May we extend your steadfast love and grace to all. And in striving to do so, we bring before you the cares and concerns and joys that are ours this day. We remember before you this day, Almighty God, those who are at odds with one another in families, neighborhoods, or offices, and even in the church. We pray especially for nations and for our nation, for places where there is struggle and conflict and uncertainty and worry and strife. Be present with us, Almighty God. Grant us your peace. Help us to discern and speak the truth and to listen with understanding, especially when perspectives are far apart. We pray for your love and your help as we seek to bring peace, and we pray for every troubled heart and place. Your mercy and grace and steadfast love, Almighty God, are never-ending. May we know that and trust in that this day. We remember before you today our veterans, each and every one who has served or is serving in the military, giving of self and time and life that others might be whole and well for all that they gave and give for their commitment and care, for their willingness to be part of something larger, we are grateful. May they know that they are appreciated this day and may we work throughout this week to remind them how grateful we are. We remember before you today, Almighty God, those who have physical needs, we pray for those who are hungry and thirsty, for the families and individuals who come on Wednesday and receive milk and butter and a smile. We pray for those who are exhausted by the demands of work or caregiving, for people who are sick or undergoing surgery, for those who live with chronic pain, bring relief and rest. We remember those weighed down with needs of heart and soul, with worries that keep us awake at night and grief that accompanies us everywhere we go. For those with depression or addiction, may you lift all of these heavy burdens with the light and peace of your presence, O loving God. And we remember before you this day, O God, not only our cares, but also our joys, a birthday celebrated an anniversary enjoyed, new beginnings, babies born, school years started, semesters coming to an end. For all that you gift to us, Almighty God, we are grateful. For laughter and enduring friendships, for cherished memories, and all that is good and kind and well, we thank you. We thank you that with you there is always a new beginning, always the opportunity to repent, always a way in which it seems there is no way. For you are hope beyond hope, and you are life beyond death. We pray all of these things, O Lord, and those things that are upon our hearts and in our minds, and we trust them to you. And we live to you now, Heavenly Father, 
the words that your son Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. or only a little, we can share our daily bread so that all will be fed. As we have received, so now we give our tithes and our offerings. as we dedicate our offerings to God and the works of his church. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are privileged to be counted among those whom you have called, graced to have been given your work to do, blessed to receive more than we will ever earn. Accept, we pray, our thanksgivings and offerings, and do what you choose with what already belongs to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 
Let us join together in singing our parting hymn, God of the Ages.
Yeah. Oh, yeah.